On this episode, I talk about bricks and mortars. I talk about almonds, kids with cash, and some other stuff. You ask questions, and I answer them. This is the Ask Gary V Show. Everybody, this is Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and welcome to episode 45 of the Ask Gary V Show. Before we go into uh, today's episode, I want to give everybody a huge shout out for all the support the last couple of days on the big screen television. Uh, thanks for watching me on Seth Meyers, a lot of fun. I was on Bloomberg for an hour just a couple of hours ago. I know there's a question today about that, which I find very real time, so thank you. I appreciate the love of the Vayner Nation. Joe asks, Gary, what trends should brick and mortar stores be paying attention to over the next 12 to 18 months? Joe, this is a great question. You know, for me, a lot of people have been talking about the second screen situation with television, right? Like people watching TV with their phone. The funny part is they refer to this as the second screen. I think we're about, mm, probably about there now, but this is very much the first screen and that's the second screen. And we'll get into that on a different show. That was kind of a little gateway drug for somebody if they want to get on the show. That would be a good question to ask. Uh, The trend, in retail for me is kind of now the second screen shopping opportunity. What I mean by that is this, your eyes are the first screen, what you're actually looking at. But think about this. One of the things that caught my mind a few months ago was I was in a supermarket and I watched somebody go from one aisle to the other and the whole time she was, sorry d she was, you know, she was shopping and she was doing this and she went around yeah, sorry, India. And she went around the end cap. Now look, brands pay a crap load of money to get those end caps or have to have the hottest product in the world going. But usually at big stores, big supermarkets, big box stores, they're paying for that positioning because it's the best position in the store, those end caps. And so the second screen shopping opportunity is really fascinating to me, right? Geo-located, you know, beacons in the store, you're in the store, you're shopping about, you're getting messaging. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't want to be annoyed in their phone, but I'm sure plenty of people when they're in Best Buy or Target or Costco or Albert or Walmart wouldn't mind getting a quick little text or notification or if they're in their Twitter stream, they're using that you know, geolocated data to understand to push a tweet. You're in Walmart, you get a tweet from Walmart that's telling you, you know, there's this deal and if you click this button and scan it, Apple Pay, second screen shopping opportunities. One of the big things I'm thinking about for Wine Library is I'm kind of like getting a little flirty with the wine world more and more kind of inching back in, Steve loves, show Steve's happiness of a face. Um, as I'm inching and thinking more about wine, I'm starting to rethink about the store and the thought of like walking in and getting content and paying, paying for wines across the board in the store at a lower price if you have the app at register. Just second screen shopping is a very big deal. Lisa says, Gary, awesome segment with Seth Myers. Lisa asks, With all this talk about snap cash, what is the one thing you'll teach your kids about money? Uh, Thanks for the love, Lisa. That's an interesting question. You know, my parents, my mom actually, really taught me to respect money. Um, You know, my dad, for an immigrant, was really a big thinker uh, with money in the business. He really let me splurge uh, and take chances. I give him a lot of credit for that. You know, it's funny, I have a weird relationship with money. I want it, um, I'm, I'm aware of its benefits, but I'm much more into the kind of like PR legacy, like, you know, where's my place in history, much more so about the dollars. I think if you try to put yourself in history, the money finds you very quickly. You know, I don't know. I mean, my biggest fear is my kids are gonna be rich versus what I grew up with and so I'm trying to figure out some level of creating respect around it. I guess the only thing that's defaulting into my mind is I'm gonna make those two work. They're gonna work so that they earn their own cash and then they can figure out what their relationship is with their cash. Hey GV, it's TF. Got a question for you for all my friends in the real estate space around the world. And the question is, how much of my advertising marketing dollars should I be spending on salespeople, telemarketing efforts versus direct mail, print, traditional versus online? You know me, buddy. I'm a no wrong way to generate leads kind of guy. What's your take on it? You know TF. I gotta tell you, I agree. 
I mean, obviously I push new forward ways of thinking about selling stuff, whether it was e-commerce back in 96, email marketing in 97, Google AdWords in 2000, banners, then content marketing in 2006. I mean, people are talking about content marketing now. I started Wine Library TV on February 21st, 2006 to do content marketing. So obviously all the social stuff, I got peeps in the background too. You know, I get it. yeah, I think that if you got away, I know we've talked in the past that direct mail really works for you as a channel. Agreed, do it, if that's working for you. I even did direct mail for Wine Library 17 months ago just to make sure it didn't bring any ROI and it was a disaster. Like it was, it was scary to me. We used to be direct mail juggernauts in 98, 99, 2000 where We'd get three, four, five, six, seven percent redemption of how many flyers we'd send out, people coming to the store. We had like six people bring the coupon to the store and we had a big value prop in it. So like direct mail clearly died for us and then other places have grown and, and, and SEM works and Facebook dark page posts are working and content clearly has worked. So I, I'm a no, you know, no romance over the lead kind of guy as well. I mean, here's my thing though. People fall in love with the way they've made their money, right? Because it's working right now. Like, I'm thrilled when I think that Instagram and Facebook dark posts and Twitter suck. Can't wait for that. Can't wait for 2024, you know, when I'm like dissing on that and I'm like, it's all about this. The virtual reality, great, can't wait, in the words of Bart Scott. You know, and so I think that, um, I think the biggest thing that I get scared about um, is that people get romantic and don't try new things. Every person watching here should always be spending between five to 20% of their money, if that's what you got, or your time, if that's what you got, on new and innovative things because they need to be prepping for 2016, 2018, 2022. And here's the biggest key, TF. No matter what you tell me, your direct mail response and telemarketing response is not as good as that same action 10 years ago. If you were doing that same calling in the background and that same direct marketing 10 years ago, it would have had a bigger ROI because more people were paying attention to those channels, their actual home phone and their mailbox than they are now in a world of this, this and everything pulling away. Not to mention the costs are higher in direct mail because you know the post office is subsidizing that loss of money. So these are the things that I think about. It's the arbitrage of the value of the ROI, not necessarily the action itself. Damien asks, Gary, do you script answers or improvise? How much time do you invest in prep and production per show? Damien, you know, here's how it goes down, Steve, you know, uh, or India in the future might. Uh, you know, just run through the questions. I do want to have like w- once. You know, it's funny. I just did the rapid fire on Bloomberg. As a matter of fact, it's weird that we actually even read the questions because I actually prefer them coming cold. We may even go to that. I'm not sure why I do that, but that's it. They were like, here come the questions. Cool. Maybe it gives me a minute or two while I'm answering this question. Think about the next one because um, I want to give it the best answers I possibly can, but I'm very comfortable in improv. I, I prefer it. I feel like they're fresh. Uh, I think one of the main reasons you guys watch this show is because uh, I bring it fresh and real and I think that matters and, and that's pretty much where I'm at with uh, the prep time and the production. That's d Rock Stefan, new, new edition. He's in the house, loves Kobe. Gotta figure that out. Uh, but I told him the truth, I'm starting to love Kobe. By the way, when I don't have vested interest in athletes or teams, I always root for the underdog. And when I don't have vested interest in teams, besides my two favorite teams left, the Jets and the Knicks, um, if everybody in America loves him or her and they're the best, I go against the green. Like I hated Tiger Woods until America hated him, right? I just, I just, I just go the, I'm, I'm just that guy. I just am that guy. Marius asks, hey Gary, can you explain in more detail your statement from market makers that Super Bowl ads are underpriced? I sure can, Marius. I appreciate the question just moments after I got off the set. (laughs) Uh, You know, I care about attention, just like the questions uh, we just answered. And so I think almost everybody in America, when the Super Bowl, at a Super Bowl party, they're watching it, and then when the commercials comes on, you hear at parties, shh, 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 like the event is to consume the commercial at the highest scale. 
couple years ago, so I did not watch both Super Bowls that included, or no, that's not true. The last Super Bowl that the Patriots and Giants played in, I didn't watch it. I just laid in my bed, like silently, and it was surreal because like, I knew that all of America was doing one thing and me and AJ were doing another thing, which was sitting in silence. And so I remember that really drills home the fact for me that all of America watches this game and then watches those commercials and the attention put on those commercials is overwhelming and just the bottom line is in that arbitrage of the ROI, I truly think that when you compare a Super Bowl ad, four or five million, compared to other ads, hundreds of thousands, that this return is so much greater than the hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars that people spend on television during the regular year when everybody's DVRing, when a commercial comes on, everybody's in here, and so I think it's underpriced by today's market. I just really do. I think a Super Bowl ad is, if it's four or five million or what they're charging these days, I think it's worth 10 to 20. I really do. Just the way it is. Question of the day for Ask Gary V four five. How many almonds are in this jar? I have bad news for somebody in this room. You're gonna have to count them. <laughs> Stefan, you're the new guy. <laughs> uh, how many almonds are in this jar? If somebody actually gets a, remember in school, like when we were growing up, like I don't, I'm old. I don't know if you guys had this, but did you guys have the jelly bean thing? They still do that with the youngsters. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, if somebody gets it right. I will fly you to New York City and I will let you sit right here and be on the Ask Gary V Show. That is how confident I am that the Vayner Nation cannot answer this correctly. If you're listening to the podcast, you need to go to YouTube and watch the show so you can get a good look at these goddamn moments. You keep asking questions, I'll keep answering them. Oh crap, wait, subscribe! I need subscriptions because I can't push this many right hooks in social, so subscribe!